Thank you, Luis. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ardo, and I represent the micromobility company. And you probably seen from the program that the next speaker is also called Ardo, also representing micromobility company. So if your name is also Ardo, you see you have at least half of what it takes to start up a company in micromobility world. It's its name. It's all that matters. So um, I'm going to talk about the insights, what we've gathered around uh, the last four and five years in developing this um, small vehicles and uh, see where we end up with. So first of all, uh, the problem we are trying to solve here, everybody, uh, maybe you don't realize, but r right now worldwide there are about 4 billion people living in uh, cities, 4 billion. And this number is going to increase by 70% in the next 30 years. 70% more people in the city, more traffic, more cars. So how is it possible? how to solve it. It's clear that we need new systems, new vehicles, new processes. So for a moment, just think about what would be your, like a dream, visionary, the best transportation method ever? What would you envision? What kind of uh, method? To me, it's very clear. I like the Star Trek version. Beam me up, Scotty, right? It's a teleportation. Just teleport you wherever you want to go. This is the best in my mind. But if I can't have it, so what would be the second best scenario? How would I want to travel if I'd had to take a vehicle? So my best scenario is like this. I don't want to, you know, really actually travel. I just want to sit there, take my stuff, and end up in a place I, I need to be. So how can we make our current technologies and vehicles to match something with this? So what does it mean for the future of a car? And actually, it's already happening. All that matters inside the car is this part. The focus is definitely going away from a driver into the backseat of a car. This is what we see when you order an Uber or a Bolt. This is all we see. We don't care really about the brand of a car anymore. We don't really care whether it runs on petrol or diesel or even elect uh, electricity. We don't care how the dashboard looks like. All we care is can we sit comfortably and most importantly, can we charge our mobile phones, right? So this is all what we care. So how is that going to change the industry? And we already see that it's changing a lot because about 50% of the people don't want to own personal car in the next five years' time. Right now, the number is 87% in UK, 88% in US. So that means that a huge number of people don't want to own a car in the future. And it does make sense, because if we look at the mobility as a service, then mobility as a service can be like four to ten times cheaper and more efficient way of transportation than owning a personal car. And why is it happening? Because when you buy a personal car, let's say for about 20,000 uh, euros, then you will only use that car for about 4 or 5% of your time. 95% of your time, your $20,000 investment just sits on the street, does nothing, absolutely nothing. Utilization of a personal car is very low. And that's why if we can use mobility as a service, we can increase the utilization from, uh, uh, let's say, to 50 to 60%. And that means the car is used 10 times more. And that's why it's more efficient. But the problem is, our current cars cannot be used 10 times more. If you take a personal car and drive about 300,000 kilometers, it takes about like 10 years. And after the 10 years, you say, well, the car is too old, I need to replace it, so you sell it. But 300,000 kilometers in a shared vehicle is nothing. It's just one year. So we need to have vehicles capable of driving 1 million kilometers, 2 million kilometers, 3 million kilometers before we break down. And we don't have these cars available right now. There's no such technology. Our motors break earlier, our dashboards break, our hinges on the car door do not last that long. So car manufacturers would have to reinvent the car as we know it. So how will the future car look like? I don't have a picture, but I have some uh, uh, maybe terms here. So first of all, brand doesn't matter, as I said. So maybe it can also be ugly. Well, not ugly, but let's say it's definitely very functional. 
functionality is uh, paramount import importance. So it has to be cheap to, uh, to do maintenance. It has to be durable. It has to last for much longer. It needs to be focused on a passenger. That's like uh, the focus is going to the backseat of a car. And uh, also importantly, we will see more and more new maybe technologies and services emerging that don't exist right now. For example, if you have a startup who is um, who's, who's willing to set up a service of cleaning shared vehicles, then I would like to invest into that. Because today, personal cars are cleaned by their owners, by users. But in the future, users are not going to clean anything in a car. So somebody has to do it. And it's a huge market, huge untapped market with huge pos uh, potential. But the problem with cars is weight. And that's why cars are not the solution. Uh, any heavier vehicle creates more heavier vehicles. So for example, if you make a vehicle a little bit heavier, you need to have more braking power to stop it. But more braking power requires bigger wheels. So bigger wheels require a little bit bigger body. Bigger body is more heavy. And so it goes. You need to protect the passenger, so you build a bigger car around it. So weight is a problem, and it's clear from this calculation. For example, if we take a car, which is average car about one and a half tons, average person about 70 kilos, and now you need to take this person uh, from, a, from point A to B for about two kilometers. This takes, uh, it means you have to move 1.5 tons of mass. If you do that with a micromobility vehicle of, of maybe 17 kilograms, that means you have to move about 100 kilograms of mass. The difference is 95%. So that means if we can change some of the trips from car, and most of the time, 70% of the times, we are alone in the car. If we can change these trips into micromobility trips, we can save 95% of energy, pollution, and CO2. 95% just by changing the type of vehicle. So that clearly is one of the reasons why micromobility micro is happening. And, um, and can we change this? Can we do this? Actually, we can, because 60% of the trips are less than 8 kilometers. 50% of the trips are less than 5 kilometers. And as uh, Inverse, the company Inverse has said, that uh, the trips up to one mile are worth about $1 trillion as a business sector. One billion dollar, uh, one sorry, one trillion dollar, dollar for, let's say, commercializing walking, right? We used to walk for one kilometer, now we pay for it so that we can have a vehicle. And people love it. It's amazing. We see that everybody loves electric scooters, electric bikes, electricity rules. Even in countries like Netherlands, Denmark, we see that the sales of regular bicycles is steadily de decreasing. And the sales of e-bikes is just going up like hell. So everybody wants to have an electric vehicle. But it doesn't mean that, um, that everything will be like micromobility. We still will have cars. We, st we have uh, electric scooters, we have e electric bicycles, we have uh, public transportation, probably more and more cars are going out of the city center. So the city center transportation will be solved by public transportation, walking, and micromobility. So all of this will stay, but they will also change. And now when we uh, look at the micromobility technology, um, you have all maybe used some electric kick scooters, electric bikes. And, uh, and you've also read that these uh, business models are not sustainable. Companies who offer these services, they don't make any money. But that's understandable, because right now we have been using generation one of uh, shared products. And this means that actually these are not products for sharing. These are just regular consumer products that, that were made for Sunday travels, occasional travels. So of course they don't last. Uh, but now, like starting from this year, and also the gig scooter we have developed, uh, we have a second version, second generation of these scooters or e-bikes, and these are built to last for longer. So instead of a first generation 30 to 90 days lifetime, we will now see one year, two years lifetime. And the products are more durable, 
they are a little bit bigger, more safer, easier to ride, easier to maintenance, to do maintenance. But that's not all of it. In the future, we are already thinking about the generation free of micro mobility products. And generation free is highly modular. That means that we can swap parts, we can just replace parts, we can upgrade parts without actually throwing away the vehicle. I'm telling in my company that our goal should be to throw away zero vehicles. We should be able to repair everything, absolutely everything. Uh, and also, uh, Generation 3 will see a lot of uh, features and gizmos on small uh, bikes. We are going to see um, more accurate GPS, which uh, also helps you to uh, regulate speed automatically. If you're on a pavement, your speed is lower, bicycle lane speed is higher. Uh, we will have um, cameras checking whether you wear helmet. We will have um, front-facing cameras for insurance cases. So all that, uh, we have automatic collision warning systems. All that is already happening and will be available for generation three. So how is that all going to change our, our city landscape and transportation? There's an interesting question I saw from um, Chuval Karmi, a city planner uh, presenting in one conference, and he asked, what caused the biggest urban revolution? What is the most popular public electric, safe, free, and fully automated electric vehicle? Think about it for a moment. What could it be? Do you have an answer? Does anybody know? You can shout. Metro. Metro. Nope. It's better than that. It's older than that. The bicycle. The answer, it, it's electric. It's fully automatic. We use it every day, almost. It's called elevator. And it's strange to think that the elevator that was invented uh, by um, Mr. Otis in 1857, this elevator has actually changed our urban landscape because before this elevator came, cities were very flat. The maximum you had maybe four-story buildings. But after the invention, invention of safety ele uh, elevator, suddenly cities became three-dimensional. You could build skyscrapers. And this is the modern look of a city. And this would not have been, avail uh, have been possible without the elevator. But did Mr. Otis think that he's going to change the city landscape? No, he just wanted to make a safety elevator. So now, if we question, how will micromobility, shared vehicles, hyperloops, supersonic trains, drone taxis, how are all these going to change the city? And I don't think that we know. I don't think that, that we can know. We might have some ideas, but the same way as Mr. Otis didn't know the answer, we don't know the answer. And all I, we can do, and I'm inviting you also, to think about what are the changes, how can your startup or your future startup not trying to plan the future, but take part of the future. How can you mm, come and play together in this field of micromobility, transportation, and how can you make the future happen? With this thought, I would like to end, and uh, thank you for listening. Nice, thank you, sir. Uh, we have a few questions here from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, talking a little bit about the, the, lo the in, in particularly in cars here, but I wonder what, what your thoughts might be. Uh, we know that kind of Rolls-Royce, when they, they changed the game in airplane engines by sort of selling them and renting them by hours used, do you think that's ever going to come down at a, late at a car level? I mean, I guess we use it at a bike level, a scooter level, but at an engine level for automobiles? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a good question, but I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't see that happening because actually what KPMG in their 2030 mobility report said that he said that some of the car makers are going to be like uh, mechanic shops basically. So mm -hmm. they are just going to make uh, uh, fleets of cars based on customer requirements and the customer is going to be the service provider. It's going to be Uber, it's going to be Bolt. So they are going to say what they need. So. Uh, um, yeah, car manufacturers are probably ne they probably need to relook their added value. But there will be two types of car makers. 
if we talk about Rolls Royce, if we talk about high brands, they will always still be there. Mm. But the maturity where you again sit into a taxi and don't look at the driver, don't look at the brand, I think these will have to change and the car will become more of a commodity. I also think that the car will have different shapes and sizes. Uh, it's a total waste to have a five-seater car to just take one person. So we'll mm. probably see a lot of shared cars to, to have like a two-seaters, mm. one-seaters even, three-seaters. So they will take less space, they are fully automated. And again, who's going to be the provider there? I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm quite sure that the motor and engine doesn't matter. And another thing you need to know is that electric car is very simple to make because electric motor has been around for more than 100 years. There's no innovation there. The only innovation is how to put it into good use. How to put it into good use. When going back to your point about the size of cars, mm -hmm. uh, my feeling is that well, the reason why we still have big cars, and I think I appreciate this as an Australian because we want a big car in a big country. It's just me driving around, I don't care. I want a big family car. And I, I think even for dear Estonian people, there's still elements of truth to that, we buy the size of the car based on an emotion, based off how it makes us feel. But is your feeling then that this may finally change when the car is no longer my personal chariot, but instead it's this thing that's maybe getting rented out and I kind of half own it? Exactly, uh, I, I, that's exactly what I was saying, that uh, if we see the statistics, people are going to abandon personal cars. They don't really care about personal cars anymore as long as their transportation um, is taken care of. And right now also, if you go to buy a car, even if it's for functional uses, you still kind of want to see the color. I mean, I, you know, I, I like any color as long as it's red, right? So that's how we shop things. But uh, the moment we start using services, these things don't matter anymore. So if you can actually uh, solve your transportation issue without investing a lot of money, they don't really care how the car looks like. Mm. So this is, I, I'm, I'm sure it's gonna happen. I'm sure it's gonna change. I'm sure, I'm sure cars will look different. And also, if you look, uh, for example, maybe, maybe London Taxi is a good example, how uh, uh, there's a more space for a driver and it's easy to clean inside. I think that's maybe the direction we're going to see the cars uh, going. Okay, so it's not to maybe come back to loop around to your original question, is it the death of the car? No, it's not, but the car is it's changing. changing. It's changing beyond the recognition, maybe. Oh, because, for example, if we talk about scooter cars, then is it a scooter or is it a car? Of legally, it's a scooter. Officially, it looks like a, like a car, but it's a something in between. It's a scar. It's a, a scooter scar. car. <laughs> okay. All scar. right. Thank you very much, Arda. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And again.